welcome to this week's Fireside Chat with Jesse. I am joined today by Charles Steckhouse, Vice President of Wafra Capital Partners. Thanks for joining me, Charles. Oh, it's a pleasure. Um, and look forward to, um, I mean, I know, I, I believe you and I've met at a few conferences in the past. Um, I know you guys are more on the IMN structured side than on the equipment finance side as far as the ELFA goes. But we've, um, we've been a little bit less active in that in, in that side of the, uh, I guess, the uh, the events calendar. Uh, but uh, but, you know, still remain very active. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm proud to say that I think I have now gone, you know, 15 years or so straight uh, by attending virtual uh, events, obviously counting as well. <laughs> they don't they don't count. I, I don't I don't I don't <laughs> we'll, count we'll give that. them half. We'll give them half partial credit. <laughs> at least. I signed up for those. Perfect. I, I signed in. I'm like, eh, eh okay. I'm going to go on. About something. an hour. <laughs> uh, it's fantastic. Um, so Charles, for the people who might not be familiar with you um, that are watching this show, do you mind just kind of introducing yourself and your career to date? Yeah, no, happy to do so. Um, and again, it's really nice to speak with you. Uh, definitely inspired by uh, Mark Banana's uh, <laughs> a visit with you a couple of months back. Well, and on that point, we'll have to sit there and see if you can keep up with some of the numbers that he's trending he, at. He was uh, we, uh, a few weeks ago golfing. He uh, he bragged to me, which is why I think I poked him a little bit to uh, to get you to invite me on this. Uh, so we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. We have, we've not wagered yet, but we'll see how uh, we'll see how this goes, and and I'll uh, I'll notify him afterwards how much uh, we're, we're putting on on those numbers. Sounds um, great. Oh yeah, happy to happy to. To, to give you some background here. And it is a little bit, so my background is a little bit varied um, as you and I have discussed a little bit. Um, I'll kind of break it up into simply uh, two kind of uh, uh, sections, sort of my pre-law school career, which is very different kind of where I am, <laughs> first, uh, which is very different from where I am today uh, and post uh, law school. Um, law school happened a long time ago, by the way. So the second half of my career is much longer than the first half. <laughs> Um, so started my career actually, uh, in politics. I, uh, I worked uh, for a very short period of time on Capitol Hill, um, huh? with that experience immensely, always uh, have been a political nerd. Um, you know, it kind of goes back to my, uh, my childhood when my local congressman, and this really dates me, would travel around our neighborhood, uh, during campaign season by bicycle and knock on everybody's door. Uh, mm -hmm. get to know, you know, everybody, uh, just, I was always very much inspired by that, mm -hmm. uh, that, and I had a grandfather who actually is kind of over my shoulder here, who was, uh, uh, for a, at least a very short period of time, uh, extremely active, not so much in elected politics, but in lobbying, um, in, in various capacities. Um, so I spent a few years doing that, uh, then followed that experience with managing a campaign for U.S. Congress down in North Carolina, which was incredibly interesting. Um, I was very much kind of outside of my scope of experience and skills in many respects. I think I was like 23, <laughs> 24 years old um, in a part of the world that I didn't know very well, other than having been down in that, that part of North Carolina once as a kid to go to the beach. Uh, marvelous experience, uh, did not end well, uh, lost that campaign, soured me a little bit on elect <laughs> election politics, uh, <laughs> for a variety of reasons. And I, and yeah. I think I knew, I think I kind of knew going in that if I were to ever kind of, uh, get back into politics, it would be much later in life. So I, I, I definitely viewed that as a phase, regardless of how that was going to end up, that was still simply going to be a phase. Um, and that ultimately I would end up in law school and then, then figure my life out. So fast forward a year or so, um, I'm helping my dad and a, a guy that I've uh, growing up, I called uncle Max, very close family friend, uh, do kind of, a uh, kind of one of those, uh, you know, um, startups in late, the late nineties. Um, uh, we thought it was very sort of uh, cutting edge technology. Um, I'm not sure if uh, VCs or others kind of felt the same way, but nonetheless, we managed to raise uh, VC money. Um, you know, ultimately, uh, we're kind of crammed down in that capital raise process, which was a very common experience um, back then. Um, so I left 
Um, my dad stayed along, Uncle Max stayed along with the business, continued to run it uh, more as minority founders at that point. Uh, but uh, I started law school. Um, again, knowing that I wasn't sure exactly where I would end up afterwards, but for the fact that I was certain that I was not going to be a lawyer. Um, and I know that sounds kind of obtuse. Like, why would you, <laughs> why would you go to law school knowing that? It's politics is still in my blood, man. Come it was on, a little man. bit of that. It. But, you know, like, and I haven't, and I haven't, I don't think I've articulated this uh, in, in recent years. Probably the last time I articulated this was when I interviewed to, uh, to, to join Wafra. But um, I think the thought behind law school was simply that, you know, I, first of all, I didn't really have any relevant business experience. Like I didn't have your typical, like, you know, two years as an analyst downtown here. Um, and I, I also thought that law school would allow me to, at least on an academic level, kind of bring to bear all of my experiences, collective experiences to date. Okay. You know, I was a liberal arts undergrad. Um, you know, I worked in politics. I enjoyed being around people. I had, I had solid, like, you know, uh, you know, skill sets, um, you know, whether that be, you know, truly kind of, you know, good quantitative skills, um, you know, good analytical skills, but I didn't really know how it was all going to ultimately be brought together. But I felt like, you know, spend a few years in New York City, uh, go to law school, do well, you know, meet some interesting people, network. Um, you know, that's, that's kind of how I ended up here in New York City was the desire to um, not spend so much time in the law library, but rather do as best as I could to compete with my friends that were in business schools where networking was obviously a very, you know, integrated part of their academic experience. So I kind of pulled that off. I <laughs> Graduated law school again. Uh, never, never a moment where I, I reconsidered, uh, you know, becoming a, uh, um, a, a, you know, going into the law profession. Uh, joined a hedge fund up in Connecticut. Um, enjoyed that experience immensely. Um, you know, ultimately that hedge fund was acquired by uh, Bank of New York Mellon. So the structure of the organization changed a lot. It went from being very much a um, you know, it was a it was an institutional business, meaning that you know we were extraordinarily well run, um, and ha had all the bells and whistles and reporting of a you know of an institutional hedge fund. But the moment that a a larger, much larger asset manager like Bank of New York Mellon came in, it just it lost all appeal to me. Um, just became much more of a structured, you know, mm -hmm. this is what we expect you to do day in and day out. Whereas yeah. before, you know, there was a lot of latitude in terms of how you would conduct your day. Um, so left that, um, went into the investment banking side of Bank of America okay. with a with a focus on uh, derivatives. So I was effectively working on hmm. um, the, the derivatives desk, the trading desk there. Um, worked with some amazing people uh, back in the city. So I was up at 9 West 57th for a while moved into one Bryant Park. In fact, we moved, I remember being one of the very first groups that uh, moved in the first day the building opened, uh, which was funny because we moved in and it, we, required, we were required to do two things. One was walk through the loading dock into the elevator bank because the, the lobby wasn't finished yet. <laughs> and, and, and we also had to wear hard hats to get into the building our first week of work. Uh, so that was interesting. Um, and again, awesome experience. But as you recall, so this is now, uh, you know, right on the cusp of the, the, the financial or Great Recession, however you want to call that. Yeah. And, you know, be, being in the, in, in the derivative space, like that was just not the place to be at that time. <laughs> now, I didn't, I didn't see the writing on the wall necessarily. I, this was, but um, I was approached by and this is where I started my career in equipment leasing and finance, uh, Icon Capital, which was at the time a large ticket equipment leasing company uh, to effectively build out a capital markets desk. So that was interesting, right? So I went from, and this was the appeal, I went from you know, structuring and marketing um, very intangible, a in very intangible financial asset, if you could even call it that, um, to you know, 
financing or leasing, you know, large tangible, you know, mission critical, you know, types of assets that are used in the real world. Um, that was very appealing to me. Um, that plus being able to basically have a tabula rasa for building out this capital markets desk uh, and to meet uh, a whole new set of people professionally. Um, and as I've come to learn over the many years now, uh, personally as well, uh, that was incredibly appealing. Um, so what was funny about that experience was um, I didn't know anybody in this space. I mean, I just didn't know a single soul. I, I think my, my first week or my means of kind of building out my, my book of relationships was taking probably the ELFA annual conventions attendee list from 2006, which was thick. It was a big book. Uh, they published it back then, uh, you know, with a, you know, a binder, yeah, yeah, so very, yeah. very impressive piece of publishing. And <laughs> I literally, I literally called everybody in that book. Um, and, you know, this was even before I had a, a very well-defined sense of our mission and our go-to-market, right? This was simply about, you know, building connectivity with yeah. Icon and, and the rest of the investing world whether that be other types of uh, equipment leasing companies, equity investors, uh, you know, banks, you know, financial companies that back then G capital CIT. So it was, it was, it was pretty cool. Um, and to be able to kind of meet those and get to know those people at a, at a peak time of need, both, uh, you know, in terms of, the type of capital that we were seeking, which is basically just a less expensive form of it, as well as at a time when, you know, banks and other types of equipment leasing companies and finance companies were really pairing back. So it was, uh, it was amazing. I mean, it's really amazing. I mean, I think back to kind of like, you know, having to learn a lot of it on my own, but also being able to, you know, lean on people in the market um, that I got to know better. Like yeah. I worked with, like I worked with Dan Kramer um, at Icon, um, who taught me a lot. Uh, Neil Whitman with GE Capital, I think, who is now officially retired, um, who uh, I got to know very well back then and, and taught me a lot. Uh, Mike Briganti. Um, so I, you know, I was able to, and, and which I think speaks to kind of the quality uh, of the of the character and the people in the space. Um, yeah. I was able to lean very, um, I think, pretty heavily on people that didn't even work with me. Right. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's amazing. I mean, I got in, in 2005 yep. um, and uh, my company was predominantly um, we did uh, people outsource their invoicing to us, Charles, yep. but they were majority of were in telecom. They had one leasing customer, which was across the bridge in Jersey, NEC financial. Yeah. yeah. They handed me an IDS attendee list to one of their conferences. <laughs> and they said, hey, here you go, kid. You know, I was 23. They're like, good luck you know, see if you can build a leasing. Yeah, yeah. And to your point there, when you, I went to a conference, I was actually at that, uh, that ELFA in 2005, where there's that big hurricane. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I heard about that. And, and it, the, it actually helped me because it, there wasn't 1200 people there. There was oh, maybe yeah. 400. Um, and when there's no power, but a lot of food and alcohol that needs to be drank. <laughs> it allowed for a little that's bit a good, more uh, <laughs> It's a potent mix right there. Yeah. Like, like, who's this kid? What are you doing here? Okay. Who do you want to meet? So. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, I've always found it to be a very welcoming uh, world and I loved it uh, as a result. I mean, I, you know, I was telling my, uh, and granted my, I think, and we'll get to it. Um, you know, my bandwidth here has expanded a lot. I mean, we do more than just, um, you know, support, equipment finance and leasing companies. But, you know, my brother who's kind of going through a, a career transition right now, you know, we were talking uh, a few weeks ago and he was kind of down about it, you know, having to do this again. I was like, listen, you know, at the end of the day, like, you know, as I just described to you, like, I feel like I've had two kind of like stages in my career. Um, but you, you, you find an ecosystem that you really do love, meaning um, it's not just the money, Right. I mean, the money is is necessary, but it's not everything. Um, but you find, uh, you know, people with whom you enjoy working. Uh, uh, again, a larger ecosystem or network of people that you enjoy interacting with and getting to know. 
And that's kind of all it is. I mean, in some ways, your profession doesn't really in, have to transcend all that much your personal life. Like I've, I've developed some really wonderful relationships and friendships um, in equipment leasing and in uh, specialty finance that again, kind of like, granted, maybe in some ways you're kind of blurring lines a little bit, but you know, it, it's not I mean, in- I mean, I mean, I mean, the reality is life happens, right? I mean, I think of the amount of people that I've spoken with that I went to high school with that I thought would be best friends forever. Yeah. And mm-hmm. even some of the college people, but let's face it. I mean, the people that you meet in this industry, you're guaranteed to see them three or four times a year because of, yeah, you go to you the are, same yeah. conferences as opposed many to- many years. Yeah. So it's like, it's a, it's a great point. <laughs> so I, I, I really enjoyed getting to do what I did there. Uh, no question. Um, did leave when times got really tough. The financial recession really took a bite. Um, ended up uh, doing something very similar uh, for uh, Mazuma Capital, which is now part of Onset. If not, it's basically fully integrated as part of Onset, really. Yeah. Um, did that, but ultimately, you know, a lot of that was uh, very sell side oriented, um, which was fine. Um, you know, in terms of my ability to kind of match more difficult deals with the type of investors that I got to know fairly well, um, it was pretty easy to do. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't enough for me. Like I ultimately wanted to, you know, straddle both sides of the fence. I wanted to be a buyer and seller. Mm-hmm. Um, so ultimately then I joined um, Hudson Valley Bank um, where we had just launched a an equipment leasing and finance group for that bank. That bank is located or was located up in. Um, and who was who was who was leading up that charge at the time? Uh, Steve Ornstein. Okay. Because so um, that Mitchell was bank. right, and that was um, I actually had sold them a system um, when I, I was think at that's least. Where we, yeah, I, I, think that's where we, team, I think so. that's probably where we engaged. Yeah. Okay. 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 Sorry, I'm just connecting some of the dots. No, here. no, no. That was a that was a true that was a, again that was like a true startup. It was very, it was, uh, it was neat to be able to do that. Um, that ultimately, though, as you know, was cut short by the acquisition by Sterling National Bank. Um, <laughs> it's like where, he, left, he left Sterling and then it's like, you can't leave. <laughs> yeah. So I, uh, uh, yeah, no. <laughs> it's okay. That's, no, it's more, more of just one of those things when I saw no, it, I'm like, huh, okay, you, you no. can't, yeah, you, you, you can't, you can't make those things up, right? Um, <laughs> For me, it wasn't the case. Uh, for me, it was simply a matter of redundancies, right? I mean, I think you've got Andre Crompton coming in this week, or you got, and uh, you know, he was their capital markets guy along with Keith Smith. I mean, those two guys, um, you know, just absolutely crushed it from a, from a, certainly from a buy perspective. Yeah. And the yeah. nature of their business didn't necessarily did not necessitate a lot of uh, sell side, right? So, yeah. Um, yeah. So I became redundant during that transition, which was you know fine. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but fast forward then, so there was, a, there were a few months there where I was trying to figure out what to do next. Um, I had several productive conversations with other banks, which were interesting, um, interesting enough. Like I think I would have, have done something, but it was getting a little bit antsy. Um, a buddy of mine, um, actually from, with whom I used to work at, at Icon Capital, uh, Marcelo Sarago, who's now at Liberty Commercial Finance. Uh, Marcelo pinged me and said that you should reconnect with the Waffer guys. I'm like, that's, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that. Like, so Waffer and I, where I work now and I got to know each other back in the icon days, um, icon and Waffer had, had looked at a number of shipping deals together. Um, but it had been a number of years since, again, I, since I engaged with them, like there was no, there was no use, uh, for, our meaning offers type of funds for a bank, right? There's just complete mismatch in terms of the way in which we looked at the world, um, rates. I mean, just a lot of, you know, ticket size is a very different, right. uh, different type of investor, right? Yeah. Um, but I took, uh, I took Marcelo's uh, advice. I reached out people I knew back then, some of whom were still here, um, you know, went in just to chat with them and ended up being a, uh, a days long interview, um, you know, went back again, um, again, just kind of surprised, pleasantly surprised. Um, I, I, I kind of had at that point excluded, I thought like, you know, going back into kind of what you maybe non-traditional finance or, um, you know, uh, non-traditional banking. 
Um, but after you know several weeks of back and forth, um, and this is now almost seven years ago, mm. I ended up here. Um, so now I'll tell you what we do. Um, I work on an investment team of basically five people. Okay. Um, our our mandate is to invest, and I'll, I'll basically say kind of across the balance sheet in many ways, okay. in specialty finance companies. That is our broad mandate. Um, now, captured within that broad mandate is a large bucket of investments that we currently have and, and have made over the years in equipment finance and leasing. Huh. Um, for example, and we talked about this a little bit last week, um, we have partnered with Somerset Capital Group um, for 23 years. So we have a, a capital you know, relationship with Somerset whereby you know, we provide them capital to fund transactions that they can't find from, you know, less expensive banking, basically banking sources, right? So Got it. we're effectively filling that kind of equity shortfall or gap in their funding. And okay. in, in traditional equipment leasing, right? Fair market value leasing, um, that sh shortfall can be rather substantial for a particular deal or certainly across a portfolio of deals. So we've had a, we've had a, uh, again, a very close, uh, you know, um, partnership with them for uh, a very long time. Uh, so much so that, you know, you know, if Evan were on your program, uh, he would probably be able to articulate better what Waffer does than I do. Um, he, he, he's, he's that, he's that close a, uh, uh, and Somerset is that close a partner of ours. Um, in fact, uh, my understanding is that in 1999, when we launched sort of these, um, especially finance funds for the first time, uh, the the fund was the first fund was effectively launched in service of Somerset. Well, and so so if you ever have to do a site visit, because I believe they have a warehouse out here in Arizona. Yeah, they do. Uh, yeah. I, I know I know Cotter's comes out here every now and then. If you have to ever do a site visit, reach out. I will stop. I will stop in. I've done I've done uh, plenty of site visits up in Milford, Connecticut. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, yeah. I, I that's, that's, a, that's a little easier, but not exactly maybe nicer at certain <laughs> times of year. It, it, it's nice. He, he's, Evan's got an office that's nicely tucked away there in the, the forest of Milford, Connecticut. But um, yeah, no, he's it's an it's an amazing business um, that that uh, Evan has uh, has built there, and uh, yeah. it's been a fun one to support because I you know I I left his name out initially, but when I think back to kind of where where I started, right um, when I picked up uh, you know the um, the attendees list, you know Evan's one of those people, right? So I've known Evan. Um, you know, personally, uh, for, you know, 15 years. Um, okay. And, you know, while we were able to kind of look at transactions with me on the banking side, it's been, uh, it's been even more interesting to me, you know, getting to know his business through this lens, right? It's yeah. much closer engagement. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it just gives an opportunity to understand the, the whole nature of what he does a lot better. Um, so yeah, so uh, Somerset is a great example of kind of one of our very long-term capital relationships. Um, you know, kind of outside of sort of staying within the equipment theme. Um, you know, as you as you know, and, and and most of the people that watch this know, you know, we also have an investment in North Mill Equipment Finance. That is uh, an investment that dates back, I think, now four years. I think that was 2018 when we did that deal. Um, so it's a, you know, we have a, we have a strong interest in equipment generally. In fact, our investors have a very strong interest in equipment um, as an asset class. Um, and when you think of Somerset and um, North Mill, they're generalists, right? They invest across all equipment types. Um, I, think, we, I think the only thing they might have is they're both in Connecticut outside of that. <laughs> yes, which works, <laughs> which, which by the way, so the other, the other uh, benefit there is that um, to Connecticut, uh, as a as a residence for both of those businesses is that I grew up in Connecticut, so it gives me a good excuse to go up and see uh, family and stuff. I, I I see that. I also saw St. John's Law School. Yeah. So yeah. So I ended up in Queens um, for uh, a few years there too. Yeah. So in 2003, that's when I graduated from West Virginia. So maybe we ran into each other at a Big East basketball tournament <laughs> in the city as well. It, it's possible. Never although to be, to, to be completely honest, so my, my parents went to Syracuse University. So uh, oh. I, uh, 
I grew, oh, I grew up a no. uh, and still am a big uh, fan of the Orange. And that was one of that was one of my deciding factors to go to West Virginia. Was my family growing up was all Syracuse fans, and I'm kind of like, uh. So like Derek Coleman, <laughs> Derek Coleman. I don't know if you remember that name. Is that? Is oh that, yeah, that no, right? I. I, uh, actually... <laughs> I, I met Derek Coleman one night at a, a bar on the Upper East Side. I'm a huge, huge uh, DC fan. Yeah. Um, so yeah, he, my... he, he, he was, he spoke at one of our uh, sports booster banquets and cause I'm from Watkins Glen, New York. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, so right. he, so, so he came and spoke and, you know, I, I think I still might even have his signature on, I don't even that's know awesome. what it was, but anyhow, yeah, sorry. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll look around and see what I have to trade you for that. That's, that's fantastic. <laughs> if I, if, if I find it, you can have it. Let me just see if I can find it. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, sure, I, I'll, I'm not sure if I have too many, uh, uh West Virginia, um, it's okay. uh, but I'll, 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 I'll keep that in mind. Yeah. No, my parents. <laughs> so as a result, I went to St. John's games as a kid. Like I would go to the garden mm -hmm. to see games with my dad. Um, and uh but i hated i hated st john's basketball I mean, it's the only I mean, thing they were good at right i mean <laughs> yeah it's funny i think that i think they've developed a decent program in lacrosse uh -huh. but um yeah that's all i think most of the rest i think most of their program outside of basketball i think and now lacrosse maybe baseball is like it's like division two or three it's not mm -hmm. It's certainly not as prominent as the basketball program had been for uh, for many years, um, but yeah. So it's funny. I didn't go to. I went to Syracuse games when I was in law school. I didn't go to a single St. John's game, even St. John's Syracuse. I didn't go to. Um, Hopefully, but, no one from St. John's is like can go back and revoke anything. <laughs> as That's long, okay. As, I as alumni relations. Uh, would yeah, I've do I've done a I've done a terrible <laughs> job there. I went to undergrad at Connecticut College, and I'm sure the uh, the alumni office would speak more glowingly of the uh, of the the gifts that I've given that school. But uh, St. John's would uh, would certainly not feel the very same way. Whatever. You got to <laughs> <laughs> you got yeah you got to. You got to pick your battles. Um, Fair enough. So yeah, so we've done a lot of so outside of North Mill and uh, and Somerset again, kind of two journalists in the equipment space. Um, we've had some funding relationships over the years with the likes of uh, Kingsbridge and First Financial. Uh, those are more kind of like serial kind of lending relationships where we were okay. simply kind of you know filling filling the, the capital gap in some respects. They were not sort of the very long term. You know, type of relationship or control relationship as you have as we have with North Mill, right? So that's a that's a that's a relationship where we are the majority shareholder in that business as well. Um, kind of outside, you know, general equipment finance and leasing. You know, we have focused on um, more broadly equipment, meaning you know we've done a lot of investments in commercial air. We've done a lot of investments in shipping. So truly kind of offshore, um, you know, crude oil um, tankers, um, container ships, um, you know, very large ticket, you know, type of shipping, um, you know, blue water vessels. Um, we've done investments in uh, modular buildings, um, crane rental, uh, like, you know, I, I, I described to you last week that, you know, I've been very uh, knee deep in a in a, a deal I was doing with our crane rental business, they were acquiring um, effectively a competitor um, mm -hmm. down in the Sun Belt, uh, which we closed yesterday morning. Um, so you know, really, our, our our interest in equipment is quite varied. Um, okay. I was going to say one of the things is like as people watch this, like what are you looking for, um, you know, in an organization to make a sizable investment? It's a great question. Um, so. It, Looking now a little bit more broadly at our interest in specialty finance, uh, that captures a much broader uh, cross section of what I would call non bank lenders, non bank leasing companies um, on both the commercial side and as well as the consumer side. So when we think about our attachment point now, the, our attachment point our capital has to the market. It's predominantly through what we call originations platforms, right? Somerset is an originations platform, right? So they're originating uh, equipment lease assets and equipment. Uh, North Mill is originating equipment loans predominantly. Um, we, we look at financial assets more broadly, right? So um, 
by way of one example, um, you know, we, uh, uh, I think this now goes back six years. So early on in my tenure, um, we acquired a, uh, a business in Northern Virginia uh, by the name of Oxford Finance. Oxford Finance, what they originate are life science loans and healthcare finance loans, right? So um, it's a financial asset, right? So our, our capital supports their acquisition of financial assets. Um, so, you know, again, these are revenue generating assets, whether it's equipment backed or otherwise, um, that our investors, uh, you know, like to invest in and to, to generate a cash return, right? Hmm. Um, the, our, our, we position our, our capital, not in the way that a traditional private equity sponsor would position capital, meaning, um, we're not looking to underwrite an investment into an originator for a called a five-year time horizon, whereby we have a, a you know a firm exit. Yeah. Rather, these investments are made for you know interest of investing into balance sheets of these businesses for uh, you know perpetual type of investments. Now, that's yeah. not that's not how it actually plays out, but that is sort of the nature of our capital. Our capital can play for, um, just like in the case of Somerset, um, an indefinite period of time, right? It's not capital markets reliant. You know, we're not doing deals with leverage. Uh, we're not doing deals that are reliant upon leverage. Um, it's very, you know, stable capital that we have at the ready um, that our investors provide to us. Um, so it provides us the ability to, again, um, acquire or make those initial investments as well as uh, continue to provide capital to those businesses as they grow. So North Mill, as you know, has grown substantially over four years, right? So yeah. um, Mark and David have done an amazing job of complementing the capital coming from us with what they have done in the ABS market um, and in the, uh, the senior warehouse market. But mm -hmm. functionally, um, you know, a business like theirs and others still need that type of equity capital to grow. And that's one of the values that our, our capital and what we kind of bring to the table. In terms of what we need beyond that, right? Uh, other than uh, an investment into originations platform that is originating a, you know, a commercial asset or a consumer asset um, is that we are looking for like best in class management teams. And a lot of people say that, um, you know, everybody, all of our competitors will say the same thing. Um, which is not to which is not to diminish the uh, what they are saying, um, but uh, you know I can firmly say, and, and certainly having worked in various aspects of specialty finance, that we really back it up. Like you know, it is it is the the number one emphasis of uh, you know how we underwrite a an investment of our capital. Um, we dedicate a tremendous amount of time, whether it's through a an auction process run by an investment bank, um, or it's one an opportunity that's kind of been brought to us by some other type of intermediary, or simply kind of a bilateral conversation that we're having with an originator. We spend an, 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 an incredible amount of time, you know, getting to know the management team, getting to know their track record, meaning, you know, how have you originated deals over your over your careers? You know, how have you underwritten those deals? You know, how are you servicing them? You know, how are you funding them? You know, how have they realized what has been, you know, what has been the sort of the net result of the investments that you guys have, have, right. uh, have made in, in those assets, um, which is a lot different. And this is where I think we are very different than, than many of our peers. Um, you know, we're looking more to their expertise than what expertise we might be able to interject into that platform. So we're leveraging existing management teams. Right. We're not we're not parachuting into any opportunity and saying like this person's got to go. That person's got to go. This whole back office is redundant. Um, that is that is that is not our approach at all. And in the many investments that I've been a part of here um, has not once happened. Um, hmm. You know, we, we consider ourselves, I think, to be and I certainly will speak to my colleagues. Uh, this is the brightest group of people I've ever worked with. Uh, but, you know, it we're not, we're not, we're not experts. You know, I'm not, I've been in equipment finance and leasing uh, within it and certainly tangentially part of it for many years, but you know, I don't know, I don't know a 10th of what Evan, you know, Bocor knows. 
no. um, you know, about equipment leasing, um, you know, or, you know, half of what Mark, you know, knows about financing, you know, equipment assets. You know, we really lean heavily into those guys' expertise. And what's interesting is that, you know, certainly during my tenure here, certainly post-financial recession, is that you, you, you wonder, like, you know, when does this model get tested, right? Like, when does our, when will our conviction, you know, ever get challenged, right? Um, and what we saw in 2020 is like the, for the first time, it's like, whoa, <laughs> like, the world is, yeah. is suddenly um, a mess, right? Yeah. The markets yeah. are upside down. Like, you know, you know, originations channels are, you know, if they're not foreclosed or shut down, they are, you know, they're running at a, at a slow drip. Yeah. You know, what does yeah. this mean for consumers? What does this mean for, you know, SME uh, borrowers? And what we discovered is like during, during, certainly during those first three months is uh, in working daily with all of our teams very close, because I mean, we're largely a, a fairly, as, as you know, I, I think was implied by my description of how we underwrite these transactions, we're largely pretty hands off. You know, we, you know, there, we certainly, there's certainly reporting and we certainly engage and, and where we can offer expertise like on capital markets, you know, those types of areas, we, we're happy to help as, as much as we can. But our businesses have run extraordinarily well on their own. Um, but during that time period, um, we had to step in, right? As good fiduciaries of our own investor capital, like we had to become a more active, you know, participant, at least in terms of mapping, you know, what this, what this, where we were going to be and where we were going and how we were going to handle it. And two things. Uh, first is the only value that we really brought to the table during that three months is capital, right? So right. our businesses were still able to fund transactions. They were still able to buy, buy equipment. Uh, they were still able to fund leases and loans. Um, but in terms of just navigating um, the day-to-day -day challenges of what they were seeing, um, acquiring new business, servicing issues, um, you know, continuing to uh, you know, rely on senior lending relationships, um, that was all them. And you know, to a platform, and we work with over 20, um, they did a remarkable job. You know, so, you know, our, our, again, our, our conviction was certainly challenged for the first time in that type of environment. But as we saw, you know, those businesses kind of come out of 2020 and certainly into 2021 and how performance shaped up, um, it was remarkable. I mean, just absolutely remarkable how, how, how high the performance was, both in terms of, you know, obviously bottom line, but, you know, most importantly, how they, you know, manage their people, um, yeah. you know, work to, you know, maintain payroll, um, just really phenomenal. So I like to think our, our approach, you know, again, for the first time really kind of faced its biggest challenge um, and, you know, more owed to the, you know, more owed to the, you know, the incredible ability of our teams, like, you know, it's, it, it's proven to hold up, you know, so it's something that we continue to remain very, uh, convinced is uh, the right way to go about our own investing. No, that's perfect. So it's like the hands off, only hands on when you really need it to be more for guidance than anything else, which is yeah, which no, is it's great. It's totally true. I mean, again, we we don't know how these. I mean, we 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 understand how these businesses operate, but yeah. um, you know, we're not in the weeds, and you know, you know, we are very good. I think in terms of helping to you know, orient businesses that are, might be a little bit less experienced in capital markets. Um, yeah. That is something that is, you know, evident. And, but, but again, that's more a function of, you know, all of us here um, are, are, are doing that daily, right? Engaging yeah. with bankers of, of, of some sort. Um, right. So to the extent that we can help some of these businesses uh, be a little bit more capital efficient, meaning continue to take capital from us, Mm -hmm. but also access when available, you know, less expensive capital to really kind of drive uh, profit. Um, you know, that's, uh, you know, that, that, that's where we can, I think, uh, you know, provide a tremendous amount of value. No, and thank you for that. Um, you know, I, re I really enjoyed this conversation because it's all the questions I was going to ask and a lot of just conversational back and forth. So thank you for that. Uh, one thing I want to touch on is the, um, the politics side 
of this, of your <laughs> pre pre WAFRA career, pre equipment finance career. Have you been to um, the ELFA uh, Capital Connections yet? Yeah, yeah. Okay. In fact, uh, so in twenty was it twenty twenty? We didn't go because of COVID. Twenty twenty one. I think that was virtual. It was different. And yeah, this year, yeah, we, oh yeah, it was virtual. This was the yeah. only year of the last, because I was on the the banking committee, huh? which is obviously stretching the definition somewhat broadly of banking. <laughs> but, but I, but I, so as as part of that banking committee, I, I've, I've been to it, and I, it, 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 it's a, it's a great experience, and it was. It was fun going back for the first time, going you know, going back like five or six years ago. Um, that was the first time I'd kind of returned to the bowels of Capitol Hill in in years. Um, and it's funny because it's it is extremely. Um, I like it. I've always liked it. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, I think, I think politics gets a, and there there are good reasons for it, but I think that there are reasons that are unfair. It gets a little bit of a bad rap. Um, yeah. There are a lot of hardworking people on Capitol Hill. Oh yeah. Uh, very committed to what they're doing. They're not checking out at 4.30 every day. Um, they're very absorbed in what they do. So the energy level on Capitol Hill is extraordinarily high. Um, it's youthful, which is cool. Um, but yeah, it's it was a blast, you know, and going back into what hasn't changed out is, uh, you know, the, the offices on Capitol Hill look very much the same as they did back in the 90s, which is more, more looking like they more, you know, had been trapped in a time warp from the seventies than, than, but, um, it was, it's an awesome experience. It's a lot of fun. I enjoyed, uh, you know, meeting with, uh, if I wasn't meeting with a Congress person, uh, it was fun to meet with staff. Um, it was fun to be able to kind of pair or bring full circle kind of what I do today uh, yeah. versus what I was doing, uh, back in the nineties, which is what they were doing. Which is basically entertaining, you know, lobbyists or pseudo lobbyists uh, from time <laughs> to time, and trying to pretend like I understood what they were telling me. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's a that's a blast. I mean, I've I've never shied, unlike a lot of people. I don't know whether this is a good thing or not, but unlike a lot of people, I've never shied away from the fact that um, you know I've worked in it and that I enjoy it, and even <laughs> kind of where I stand. And, and there's 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 a decent amount of I can't say decent amount. There's at least a handful of people that I know in this industry that that's what they like. That's what they enjoy doing outside of work. Yeah, no, so, it's 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 um, good to get engaged. I mean, I yeah, you know, I I there's only so much you can really do as a full time professional. I think to you know to volunteer in politics. You know, I did. You know, in law school was probably the last time I had seriously devoted time outside of you know school to volunteer i worked on uh, a couple of presidential campaigns uh but um and i don't have time for that anymore so you can easily write a check or i mean that's that's made very simple these days but I, it, that that kind of engagement is nice it gives you a chance to it's one thing to to watch it read about it and think about it um but it's at least for me it feels good from time to time to kind of express it and you know, capital connections is one good example of, of that. Well, and hopefully, I don't, and I don't know if, if you went to any capital connections pre-COVID, but yeah. um, mm -hmm. those were a lot, a lot more energy just because there were yeah, restrictions, fantastic. and it was just. So hopefully, we get closer to that next year. But, yeah, I think, uh, I think so. I think we'll I think that's that, I think that's inevitable. Yeah, it's a, it's a <laughs> it's a great it's a great program. Um, obviously, there are. Even you know, even on some of the more arcane issues, there are some issues that, from time to time, um, you know, certainly do creep into the conversation that are important for yeah. the um, industry's voice to be heard. And I think it's louder than people realize because I think in some ways, you know, it's it does pair with some of the louder lobbyists in finance and, and in banking, um, so it's amplified. Uh, but but to get but to hear, I think, um, you know, from from our group most directly um is uh it can be really beneficial there are so many questions i want to ask you but i want to be cognizant of time too um i know we're a little bit over do you got a few more minutes here? yeah absolutely yeah, i sure do okay um so obviously you're i mean not obviously you're in manhattan you know um well, has... looks like... <laughs> unless you have some amazing background that the <laughs> yeah, just magically just goes yeah. 
but um like how are the streets like how are the um you know is is it back to what it was pre pre covid like is there that buzz of the city like, are the buildings mm-hmm. full like so I, I so it's funny we we came back to the office in july of 2020 so when we came back to the office in july of 2020 you had to bring your lunch because there was no food places open <laughs> well there was there was at least one place open sweet green which is what i now have ordered every single day for the last two years um <laughs> The uh, so thank God for that. Uh, no, it was uh, it was a ghost town. Like I had never, and it was sad. I mean, I'd never. Yeah, you know, I lived in Manhattan for many years. I'd never ever seen it um, like that before. Um, I mean, there were we drove. Many of us drove into the into the office. So I drove in from suburban New Jersey. Um, front door to office desk was thirty minutes. There wasn't a single day of traffic. Mm. that i faced it, i but i mean it was crazy um now where in new jersey do you live charles uh so i live we, we live in maplewood new jersey so ordinarily with traffic that's you know hour and 15 minutes oh. so 30 minutes and that includes like giving the you know the keys to the valet like getting in the elevator bank and sitting down it was crazy mm. um there was nobody on on the streets at all um where we were on Park Avenue, you know, we had a pretty good viewpoint of other office buildings and into other offices. There yeah. was not a soul. In fact, for a year, I didn't see a, a single person in another office building. Mm-hmm. I didn't see a single person in our lobby. And we weren't, wow. we weren't, we weren't a high traffic building, but um, that was still strange. Yeah. Um, now it's definitely different. Like there was, there was a moment where I would say right up to Thanksgiving last year, right before the Omicron um, concern, uh, where tourist traffic and uh, work traffic had picked up a lot. Still, uh, I mean, still light by comparison, but noticeably more than there was a few months earlier. Um, then it dropped off uh, again a lot. I mean, from you know end of Thanksgiving to February, like it was. It was it, it wasn't quite a ghost town, but it was it felt it felt like we had taken a, a massive step back in terms of just pedestrian traffic and and yeah. energy level. Um, you know, now it now it it, it kind of does feel like normal again. Uh, the numbers don't fully support it, which is funny. Like I'm on a crowded train now, but it's not quite as crowded as it used to be. Um, do you have to wear do you have to wear masks on the train? No, they took, they removed that requirement sometime in the spring. Hmm. I typically do just because it just, there, there are a lot. No, of- I was, it was more of a, just a question. Cause I was talking with no, no, it's, who, it's, 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 it was a, a month good- ago in Chicago and they said they still had to. So I was kind of like, like, I- yeah, no, it's, it's not a bad, it, it's, you know, it's funny if you mentioned that because on, so on New Jersey transit, you don't need to oh. on the subway system. I'm not sure here. Um, I mean, there's, I there's, no, there's not anything wrong with it because I mean, I've been on no, a no, but it's, forever, it's, and I, I, I used to get like one or two sinus infections a year just for the amount of travel yeah. that you do, and it's like, huh, I'm not sick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's it, listen, it's not, it's not, it's never a bad thing if you're around a lot of people. Um, it, it, certainly now to to be you know conscientious of it, but in terms of requirements, no, so New Jersey Transit, not. Uh, I'm not sure sure about the subway. I typically will walk from. Penn Station to the office. Um, I've always done that, um, regardless of the, um, you know, what 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 viruses are running around. But uh, but it it has changed. But it it is funny when I I know that the data don't necessarily support the what I see. Like there are there seem to be more people back than actually. Um, mm-hmm. The data seem to suggest that you know fewer than fifty percent of the people are have actually returned to the office. Now then maybe talk, I'm not sure if there's kind of differentiating, you know, a day or two a week or, you know, five days a week. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, but it 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 feels a lot more like 2019 in that respect. So that's good. That's been great. Cause it was, you know, I love Manhattan. I mean, it's an amazing city. Um, it's a great city to kind of, you know, in terms of energy and vibe, and that's all people, right? Um, yeah. and certainly for that first year, year and a half, um, I was sad. I mean, you, you just 
you, you were wondering whether or not you know we'd ever actually return uh, to what yeah. we once were. Um, but thankfully, it looks like we're we've kind of turned that corner. Good, good, and I appreciate you answering that because that's always one of those. I mean, I lived in uh, you know Yonkers and the Bronx. Mm -hmm. um, I, I my first job out of college, I wanted to be in the city because I yeah. have friends, and brothers things. who lived in the city, and it's like if you can't make it, you know, if you can make it there. You know, not to be cliche, but um, <laughs> that's okay. It's know, just true. Just... That's all. <laughs> but um, you know, I do ask everyone who comes on here, Charles, a little fun fact about themselves. So um, yeah, no, I uh, like I'm share? aware, and I, I get I, I I gave a lot of thought to this. Um, there are a lot of fun, obscure facts probably about me, but I'd say the 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 funnest fact uh, about me is really. Um, so I met my wife uh, 11 years ago, a little over 11 years ago on Match.com. So we met, we met online, which was funny because we were both very social and dated a lot and met a lot of people in the city, but it just so happens we met that way. Um, we got, Allison and I got married, we got engaged rather quickly, which was, yeah. and mind you, this was late in life for me. Like I, I uh, you know, I, I didn't get, uh, married until a little bit later than most of my friends, uh, if not all of my friends. Um, so it all happened in the blur. Like we were married within a calendar year, basically. Um, we had our oldest, Gavin, uh, about a, a year after that. Things were happening very quickly. Life was changing rapidly. And then uh, in short order, we moved from Manhattan to Hoboken. We did huh? we lived there for a few years where we had Charlie. Uh, Charlie is my five-year-old who turns six tomorrow. Um, Happy birthday, so, Charlie. What's that? Happy birthday, Charlie. Yeah, no, we're, uh, we're it's, it's crazy. As you, as you can appreciate, they, they grow very quickly. Um, but, uh, yes, yeah, so that's my fun fact. I've got this amazing family. Um, it seemingly happened out of thin air. I think I had gotten to the point where, I don't know, I was, pretty, I think I was pretty confident that this whole marriage and kids thing probably was never going to happen for me, but, uh, yeah, I thanks, mean, to, no, thanks to the wonders, that, that was, wonders of technology. That was good old match.com, man. Yeah. I'm not even match. sure. I, I'm sure it looks a lot different now than it did back then. Yeah, you know, you know, if it works, it works. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> uh, it's fantastic. And then you're in Hoboken. It's like, hey, this is a party town. I gotta, I gotta move further, <laughs> further away. Yeah, it was. I, I just to put in a <laughs> just put in a quick uh, uh, pitch for that. It's a great town. I mean, it's you know, you you, you obviously reference Frank Sinatra, so it's got a got that that connection. But um, it it's funny. I I'm not sure if I ever thought I would end up in having grown up in Connecticut. Um, Hoboken, let alone New Jersey. But living in Hoboken was a blast. Like we were kind of on the water. Uh, we were on the water. Um, took a ferry across to Manhattan every day. It was like walking to work. Um, awesome. So big time plug for that town. Awesome town. Uh, would have stayed in it, I think, longer, but for the fact that you just you just can't do schools there. Um, so we moved to the uh, proper suburbs uh, uh, four years ago. Well, and I can relate to that too from upstate New York. Yes, you, know, you the, can. The, the, the city is frowned upon. Like, why are you <laughs> going to the city? Like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, all right, Charles. Well, I appreciate your time today, sir. Thank you for uh, for sharing your story, uh, talking more about Wafra. Um, so I'm guessing I'll be seeing you where in Marco Island. Marco Island. Yeah, can't wait. I know that. Uh, I know that hotel well. It's it's funny. My uh, my in laws have rented a uh, have rented or leased a uh, a unit in the building right next door to the Marriott for 40 years. Oh wow. So for the last 11 <laughs> years I've been sneaking into the uh, to the pool at the Marriott. Might oh, wow. I, might not have to sneak this time around. Might not have to but it might be more fun if you do. <laughs> it might be. But I look forward <laughs> to seeing you there. All right sir. Well I appreciate your time today and um, look forward to seeing you in October. Thank you. Take care Jesse. Thank you. All right.